Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. And happy birthday, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to spend my birthday with you, Matt. No one else I'd really spend my birthday with. Uh, I'm up to 52. Uh, and I'm going to uh, allow myself a birthday indulgence for the show today, Matt. Please, by all means. So, so my last birthday, I was gifted uh, this banjo. I never played banjo before. Uh, you know, I play a little bit guitar and, and piano. And so I'm for not quite a year, but roughly a year, I've been playing a little bit every day. So I'm hardly a good banjo player. I'm sure I'm going to do something very badly right now. Uh, but I don't get to play for many people. So now you get to suffer for like literally you know, uh, dozens of people will see this. So. That's right. That's right. Uh, and I've mostly just been trying to learn Foggy Mountain Breakdown and Dueling Banjos. Like I, I will do like a few minutes on each. These are each these day. would be like the standards of uh, the yeah. bluegrass genre. And I, 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 for number one, I'm going to make mistakes. And number two, I know I'm not playing Foggy Mountain Breakdown fast enough the way it's supposed to be played. But this is this is as good as I can do. And it's my birthday. And and, and, and I'm hoping, Bill, in a week or so, I will uh, have my guitar tuned up and, and maybe we'll play a song or a, at least a few notes together. Yeah, I'll, I'll get my flat top guitar ready. <laughs> awesome. So here we go. <laughs> I screwed up already. One more time. That's Foggy Mountain Breakdown. So not I feel perfect. like I should be like uh, Denver Pyle just going, <laughs> you know, like playing the jug or something. All That's dream. Like, I need to get... Um... I want to get a proper jug and a proper washboard and have that on, on the front porch and get a, get a real jug band going. I love it. That, that's, that's the dream. The, uh, did you ever watch those old Andy Griffith episodes with the, I think they were called uh, the Dillards was the, the real band name and they would come on I Andy. Never, once I never could get an Andy Griffith. All right. Well, they had some real good bluegrass music on there and uh, some of the Ernest T. Bass stuff is Ernest T. Bass episodes. I highly recommend you get, you would like it, Bill. I think you would. <laughs> so we'll do uh, some, We'll do some picking and a grinning uh, in the next week or two. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, see, normally on your birthday, you you do this thing, which I admire, where you basically plan to do whatever you want. Yes. And you tell everybody, I'm going to be at the bowling alley at 10 a.m. I'm going to yep. be getting a slice of pizza at 11.15. That's what, that's I'm what we're doing. Eat, eating donuts at 2. How, you, you doing that this year? Yeah. So, uh, so today, the actual birthday, um, I got a limited window where I can go out to eat with my kids' schedules. But we're, we're going to hit a five guys for dinner tonight uh, for the weekend. Uh, I'm going, there, there's an annual used book sale, uh, that is really good near my house. I hit that in the morning. Uh, I'm going to go to a, it's a, my usual candle pin bowling. I'm, I'm going to do a golf driving range. I'm not a golfer, but, uh, my wife likes to, I mean, my, my wife's not a golfer either, but she likes just hitting balls far. <laughs> so we, we never get to do it. So I'm going to do that. Uh, hit with my favorite barbecue places. Then we're, then we're going to go see Beal Juice, Beal Juice in the theater. That's fun. Uh, and Sunday donuts on top, on top of Mount Sugarloaf. Uh, and there is a uh, used record sale uh, downtown uh, in the afternoon. So that and is... you put word out other friends can join you or not. Yeah, like, right. This it's is it. my schedule. I will be here. I mean, yeah. honestly, at this point, most of my friends don't even come. It's it's most just me doing what I want to do. But you know, you get a little here and there. Uh, maybe maybe people come to the movie. Maybe they'll come to dinner. But the point is, I do what I want to do. Love it. And if you want to come along, great. It's hard having friends as a as an adult male. Uh, people. <laughs> People don't. It, no, it really is. Like, like I've got friends I'd love to hang out with, but they've got jobs and wives and kids and and stuff. Uh, so I have to make excuses to get my friend. I have to ask him to help me move something to get him to come over to my house. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's not, not about me. It's about you. Happy birthday, Bill. Thank you. Um, and many more. Uh, and you already got a birthday present, as far as I'm concerned, which is you had a yet again. This is the second time in like a month this has happened <laughs> where you have written a column calling sort of manifesting something like demanding that something in the world happen. And then immediately the democratic party, like you, Bill share is, is mad at us. We must do what he, what he demands. And like, this is the second time it's happened, right? Well, this is more, uh, you know, the, the article came out and their statement came out like around the same time. So I probably really can't credit myself for the, the, the development, but uh, the first argued... time was a deb you said they should ask this question in a debate. And no, they no, asked no, no, no. the last time was, I said, Kamala should pledge to name a Republican to her cabinet. Uh, I wrote that in the morning of the CNN interview with Dana Bash. And Dana Bash asked her that question that afternoon and, and Kamala answered in the, in the affirmative. Yes. Um, 
whether I had anything to do with that, I think is probably very uh, dubious. But that, that I, think, the no, I, I, I think it's obvious you had something to do with that. I mean, no, today's story, perhaps coincidental, but nevertheless, it shows that you were on top. Uh, that you were, if nothing else, Bill, you were thinking the exact same thing that the top strategists from the Democratic Party, at least in the Senate side, were thinking. So tell us, what did you call for? So uh, I wrote this morning that Democrats need to start spending in the Senate races in Florida and Texas. Uh, they've been long seen as reach states, long shot states, which and they arguably still are. Uh, to make matters worse, they're literally the second and third biggest states in the country next to California. Uh Texas has 20 media markets. Florida has 10 media markets. They're incredibly expensive states to compete in. So you really, you really can't go in for a penny. You got to go in for a pound if you're going to really compete. Uh, and that, and there have been plenty of times recently where Democrats spend a lot of money there and just get their heart broken. So there's a lot of you know, PTSD about it. Uh, but just looking at just, just September polling, polling this month, uh, the average margin in Florida and Texas, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, so in Texas, it's a two-point race. In Florida, it's a 2.8-point race. And Montana, and Montana has been seen as the likely linchpin which way the Senate control falls. We only have one poll in September, but so, but it's tester behind by seven. Yeah. And that is in line with most of the August polling, which is not that much of, but there's, there's, right. a, there's a few. But uh, conventional wisdom, Bill, is you defend, you don't, you don't go try to take someone else's turf until you can defend your turf. And so conventional wisdom would suggest defend, put all that money in and test her, right? That, that's what normally would happen. Well, yeah, I mean, and you know, an incumbent will have more natural advantages than a challenger. And testers, you know, he's m made miracles before. I mean, he's, he's won three terms in Montana as a Democrat, uh, which in and of itself, you know, is stunning. Uh, and so I don't want to discount his skills or assume that the polling... It has to be correct. There's not, there's not a lot of it, number one. Uh, we have a case from 2020 with Susan Collins in Maine where Collins was behind in every poll, literally every poll. Uh, and she won by nine. Now, that's probably an inflated margin because they were using ranked choice voting in Maine and there was a left-wing independent candidate who got five. Uh, and so since Collins got a majority, they didn't go to the second round and re redistribute the votes. So it was probably more like a four point win than a nine point win. But nevertheless, it's an overperformance of where the polling was uh, because Susan Collins had a pretty solid brand in the state as an independent moderate. She ran a pretty uh, uh, clever but vicious attack campaign against her opponent. They didn't get, you know, didn't splatter back on her in any way. Never really got, she never really got called out for running a mean campaign. She really get, was able to kind of go, her positive campaign was so positive that people didn't attribute the negative campaign to her. Uh, and, and there wasn't that much polling lay in the game. So if there was like a shift in the dynamic, the polls weren't picking it up. Um, although there are some reports that the internal polls were picking it up. So, you know, things, things can happen. I'm not, I'm not, so I'm not saying Democrats need to pull up stakes in Montana. Um, but he already has a lot of money. I mean, you know, Montana is a cheap state to compete in. So those airwaves are saturated. It's just nonstop political ads for everybody. Uh, and... For Republicans to take the Senate, they need to net gain two. Because it's 51-49 now. And they, assuming Kamala wins, which, of course, she might right. not win. But if, and, West, if, and West Virginia is already gone, exactly. effectively. So, so it's 50 Republicans have one locked in West Virginia, and yeah. they need to net gain one more. Uh, if they were to have control with a Democratic president. If they if it's a Republican president, a net gain of one would be enough to have, you know, potentially a trifecta after they kept the House. But to the extent this really matters to Democrats... It matters that they have a Democratic Senate for a President Harris, so she could get judges through, get her cabinet confirmed. Uh, I mean, obviously, legislation matters, too, but most legislation, we need 60 votes, not 50. Uh, it's kind of more like, can this place function at all if without nominal Democratic control? Uh, so Democrats right now, and of all the races that we're seeing as potentially competitive, they're winning by a lot. Maybe not like enough to say that's like a done deal, but like you're talking you know, five points or more. You're talking Arizona, Ohio. Not, not Ohio, not Ohio. Uh, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, uh, Maryland, which well, that could be competitive because Larry Hogan. Um, it might be oh, Nevada. Nevada was what I was thinking of, the other one. Uh, those all look really good for Democrats. Ohio has gotten tighter, 
Uh, that's really a dead heat race right now in September polling. I'm sure Brown, the average was up by 0.3. And the crypto industry is just flooding that state with money to take out Sherrod Brown. Why? So Why? Well, Sherrod Brown's been, it's, it's pretty populous when it comes to banking regulations. He's, he's, he's not going to be crypto's friend. Uh, with his, and it, forgive me for digressing, but like you know, Kamala Harris has been putting out some feelers to crypto saying, hey guys, you know, don't look at me as the enemy. You know, we can, we can do business because she doesn't want all that money going you know, in one direction. But Sherrod Brown, I think, was not inclined to play that game. And if he even tried to play, it wouldn't get very far because everybody knows he's, you know, pretty tough when it comes to, you know, the finance industry. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so he's not he's not a lock. I mean, he could go down them that this could all be for naught. But uh, if Sherrod did pull that out, uh, it would be almost the inside straight Democrats need. But for Montana, at least the way the polls are right now, who's tester? Pull- who's tester running again? Who's tester's so, opponent? So he's up against Tim Sheehy. Uh, and Tim Shee's never run for anything before. He's a former Navy SEAL and a businessman. Uh, he's got potential vulnerabilities. He he's told inconsistent stories about a wound that he has, whether or not he got that from Afghanistan or not. Uh, he was recently caught on tape m- making a crack about uh, drunk Indians, and there's a pretty you know, decent sized Native American vote in Montana. Uh, and just the other day, there was a story that he put out a memoir last year that there's credible uh, accusations of plagiarism in that book. Hmm. Uh, so there's things to say, right. uh, but is, has Montana just gotten so red that it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, the current governor, Gio, Gianforte literally physically attacked a journalist and you know, when, when his house raised and became governor after that. So maybe it doesn't <laughs> matter anymore. Uh, and, um, and, and there's an argument that the times New York times put out that the population has changed because of wealthy conservative transplants like Tim. She is you know, Tim. She is a, is not a Montana born and raised. He's from Minnesota, came out about 10 years ago. Uh, and this is the card that Susan Collins played. I mean, she was up against Sarah Gideon, who was literally the speaker of the Maine House. It's not like she just showed up yesterday, but she wasn't born and raised in Maine. And so there was a lot of like, is she really from here kind of rhetoric in in the ads. That, and whereas, you know, Collins was portrayed as sort of Maine through and through. So Tester is really trying Ted to- Cruz is from Canada. Right. Um, and by the way, so I listen. He's running against or Colin Allred, right? Uh, who's a Texas, former yes. NFL player, a congressman from Texas, is is running against Cruz for the Senate. I don't know if you heard this. I listened to a um, Sarah Longwell focus group podcast, and so many of the people that she interviewed voluntarily brought up that. Remember when there was like an ice storm in Texas, mm-hmm. and Ted Cruz went to Cancun? Yeah, well, people were voluntarily. I don't know if all red is making this an issue, but it seems like voters, like if there's one thing that could push them over uh, to, to go against Cruz, it might be that. Like every ad I've seen from all red has at least the image of Ted Cruz wearing a mask, wearing a lone <laughs> star flag mask right. in the airport uh, going to Cancun. Uh, so they're playing that card pretty hard, but I get it. And, and all reds fundraising today has been pretty good. He's been pretty much on par with Cruz in fundraising, although I think Cruz is getting a bit more help from the outside groups. Uh, and Allred has, I believe, outspent Cruz in ads so far, but in future ad bookings, it's Cruz by a mile. So uh, it, so Allred's not really poised to overtake, at least in the, in the, in, in the ad war. And Texas, a lot of Texas is ad work that's so big. Uh, so if, if the national Dems are serious about putting money in, that might at least level the playing field and make this so make the, make, keep, keep this competitive. Two questions for you. One, because Texas has been fool's gold for Democrats, just like before Trump, Pennsylvania had been fool's gold for Republicans. Do Is it actually possible? Because if Texas becomes a purple state, that has all sorts of implications electorally. Is it actually possible that Cruz could lose? And if so, um, do the Democrats need to pick one? I, I, I feel like Texas and Florida are both so expensive. You can't really play in both states. Or, or can you? Well, I, I'm not the guy looking at the budget. You know, I, I can't tell you how much they have, how much they're going to have, how much they need. Uh, and what, it, like, what would it take? I mean, I don't think they're going to outspend either Ted Cruz or Rick Scott. Rick Scott can spend, you know, all day long because he's a yeah, multimillionaire. He's a filthy rich politician. Yeah. You, he, he's he number always one, dig into his pocket more no matter how much you put in. So, which, and I understand that being a disincentive to playing, it's like, well, I'm not, I, I can't win this arms race. There's just no way. Uh, but you're talking about control of the entire Senate. You're talking about something that's going to determine if 
Kamala Harris can win, what that presidency is going to look like. So even if it's like a 10% chance, you got to try. You got to at least put enough money in that the media treats it like a serious race. It's not putting money in because you hope to outspend because that's not realistic. But it's enough to, to, to signal to the broader world, we are actually trying to win this. It's not a joke. Well, uh, and I think we one thing that they both have going for them is I think both of them are pretty unlikable. You know, I mean, they're both incumbents. They have the advantage of incumbency. They're both in states that are certainly have been Republican states in recent years, but neither of them are really that likable. And neither of them really, I think, um, are beloved by the Trump lovers. You know, I mean, they're kind of both maybe seen as posers to a certain degree. Well, I mean, I, I think Cruz is definitely an underperformer in Texas. Uh, and both have done things which leave leave them open to attack. You know, Cruz in the Cancun thing and Rick Scott, you know, essentially saying he was going to, you know, make Social Security um, subject to, you know, uh, fresh votes every few years. We, we, I, know I, don't, I always back off of that. So that's not what he meant, but there's enough on the record that you could use against him. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think they're inherently strong candidates in terms of their individual skills are concerned, but they might be buoyed by, you know, the red nature of their states and the, the amount of money that's going to come in. Uh, but to answer your original question, it was just fool's gold for Democrats. I mean, the, the big unknown here, I, I don't think Democrats have wasted their time in Texas to date. Uh, they have continued to improve in Texas. I mean, not because of their ability, but just because of the changing nature of the, of the populace, you know, younger workers coming in for tech jobs in Austin and things like that. Um, so 2012 presidential race, Mitt Romney beats Obama by about 16 points. 2016, Trump beats Hillary by about nine points. And 2020, Trump beats Biden in Texas by five and a half points. So these are pretty big jumps, uh, cycle to cycle. Now, it doesn't automatically mean that that's a never ending, you know, trend of improvement for Democrats. Like it could plateau depending on all sorts of factors. But uh, we, I don't think that the pollsters can easily say, I know how to weight this electorate, but I can look at past elections and know exactly how to weight the different demographics here. It seems to be a changing electorate. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reluctant to say, or it can't win. It's impossible. They're, they're, they're going to hit a dry hole. Like they all, you know, Beto gave it his all. And, you know, and it, you know six years ago, he got close, but they're never going to get closer than that. I just don't think that can be known. And so you might as well compete, at least give it a shot, especially since there's really no uh, upside in not competing. It's not like I really need this money to go somewhere else. Like it's all uphill, <laughs> you know, Montana, Ohio, Florida, Texas, it's all uphill. And so you might as well at least give yourself a, a fighting chance in all of them. And Colin Allred seems would seem to be, a, you know, it's tough for a Democrat to win in Texas, but I would assume he's a pretty good candidate, all things being equal. Yeah, I would think if, if you, you stripped away Texas, <laughs> stripped away electoral history, stripped away Trump-Harris, like Colin, Colin Allred is a better candidate than Ted Cruz. Uh, Colin, he's likable. He's a former football player. He knows how to speak to the middle. Um, he just seems like a, a normal human. Ted Cruz, there, there's not a s single human being that would say Ted Cruz is a likable candidate. Nobody believes that. Um, you know, Al Franken had a great line where he said, um, uh, I have to phrase, I have to phrase it properly, um, where I, 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 I'm going to botch it, you know, um, where he said something so, so, so along the lines of like, I, I, I like Ted Cruz more than most and I hate Ted Cruz or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, Florida is, is sort of a bigger unknown because the Democratic nominee, Debbie uh, Mercastle Powell, she only won her primary last month. I mean, she was uh, presumed to be the nominee, but she did have to technically get through that stage before she could even start a general election campaign. And she's farther behind uh, in fundraising, farther behind in advertising. And yet she seems to be starting three points down, which is not bad, right? Not done very much. Uh, so... What would happen if Democrats, I mean, it seems like the DSCC is going to put some money in now. They had an announcement today that there's, there's going to be multi-million dollar TV buy in both states, but what? But there was no fixed number to it. Mm -hmm. So multi-million could be two million, which wouldn't be all that much in either one of these states. But if you could uh, force if you could force Republicans to have to play defense in Texas and Florida, then obviously that has other you know positive ramifications. Uh, maybe. I, mean, I, I, I don't really believe that's going to help Democrats that much. Yeah, I, I think Montana is saturated. I don't know how much more money can make a difference there. 
uh, and Ohio, you know, it looks like crypto is coming in to save the day for Marino no matter what. Uh, so I don't think uh, it, it's not clear that Brown can get parity there money wise, or maybe because they're not going to outspend Marino in total there. Uh, so I, I don't think you're going to say drain Republican coffers. Yeah. All these other races seem like they're going to go the Democrats way anyway. Um, I don't, I don't want to get I don't want to get too in the weeds on this one, but the crypto thing. I mean, I know I just know the bare bones about what it is. Um, why? I mean, are there efforts to to ban it? Why are they all of a sudden playing so heavily in politics and donating so much as opposed to like the banking industry writ large? What is it about crypto specifically? Well, it's it's an unregulated industry for the most part right now. And and there's definitely some sense that like, you need some regulation. Um, you don't want a situation where like some weird crypto thing like takes down the entire global financial ecosystem. Uh, and uh, so there's been some stabs. At, I'm, I'm not the expert here. So forgive me for, for speaking a little too off the cuff. My understanding is that they haven't passed anything of real substance yet when it comes to what this regulation is going to look like, but something's coming down the pike and they want to make sure they've got friendly people in place when that, when that happens. Um, I'm fascinated by that. I know nothing about it, but uh, I need to read up, obviously. Okay. Like, um, I, I think it's so stupid. I don't, I don't want to learn about it. I don't want to spend my time getting into the details of it because I think it's so inherently ridiculous. I can't believe anybody would do it. But we're at this place where, we're, where enough people do it that you better have some rules of the road. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on. I wrote a piece this week, Bill, um, for The Hill about, Don, I don't know if you saw this, Donald Trump Monday night, he's in Pennsylvania, and he starts making a play for, obviously, you've, you've been covering this uh, at Washington Monthly, the gender gap. He's obviously mm -hmm. afraid of this gender gap. And he starts yep. making this weird thing where he's talking to women and he's saying, like, I'll be your protector. I am your protector. I'll make your anxiety go away. You won't even be thinking about abortion. It was so, about abortion, it was so weird, so... Um, Anyway, let me just play the clip. Uh, it's kind of a long clip, and then we can talk about it on the other end. All right, so we have to talk business. I always thought women liked me. I never thought I had a problem. <laughs> but the fake news keeps saying women don't like me. I don't believe it. I think, I think, you know why they like, they like to have strong borders. They like to have safety. Nothing personal. I think they like me. But I make this statement. Thank you. I love you, too. I love you, too. Thank you. But I think they like me because I represent something that's very important. I make this statement to the great women of our country. Sadly, women are poorer than they were four years ago, much poorer, are less healthy than they were four years ago, are less safe on the streets than they were four years ago, are paying much higher prices for groceries and everything else than they were four years ago, are more stressed and depressed and unhappy than they were four years ago and are less optimistic and confident in the future than they were four years ago. I believe that. I will fix all of that and fast, and at long last, this nation and national nightmare. Nashville, a Nashville nightmare. We've got to end this national nightmare. Because I am your protector. I want to be your protector. As president, I have to be your protector. I hope you don't make too much of it. I hope the fake news doesn't go, oh, he wants to be their protector. Well, I am. As president, I have to be your protector. I will make you safe at the border, on the sidewalks of your now violent cities, in the suburbs where you are under migrant criminal siege, and with our military protecting you from foreign enemies, of which we have many today because of the incompetent leadership that we have. You will no longer be abandoned, lonely, or scared. You will no longer. You will no longer be abandoned, lonely, or scared. Now, you you can see in that in this video here. You can see um, to Trump's right, he is looking at a teleprompter. Yeah, you can see the teleprompter in, in that, and, and you can see yep. while he's talking at times. He's looking at that teleprompter. This was so a this plan. Is, this is not. This is not off the cuff. The off the cuff part is when he sort of repeats it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you'll not be afraid. You won't be afraid. You know, that's that's I, that's the off the cuff. And I, and I, I know I, we weren't necessarily going to talk about this, but I've been seeing folks complain that Kamala Harris keeps repeating words in her interviews. It shows what an idiot she is. Like, have you seen our competition? Uh, it, let, I mean, let, let's finish this, though. We're, we're not yeah, even yeah. we're getting into. Oh, oh, there's more. I'm sorry. Oh, there's more. OK, but this is the life of Julia. Do you remember that okay. bill from 2012? I don't. Barack Obama put out this infographic. It's called The Life of Julia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2012. And the criticism was this woman goes through her entire life. And there's no husband, uh, civil society. It's, it's, it's all government taking care of her. And Donald Trump, this is his life of Julia, except instead of government, it's Donald Trump. You're not going to be in danger any longer. 
You will no longer have anxiety from all of the problems our country has today. You will be protected, and I will be your protector. Women. <laughs> women will be happy, healthy, confident, and free. You will no longer be thinking about abortion. So all they talk about abortion because we've done something that nobody else could have done. It is now where it always had to be with the states and a vote of the people. So women, thanks to Trump, women are going to be happy, healthy, free, free of anxiety. Um, and uh, they won't even think about abortion anymore. I mean, it's, I first saw that phrase in a truth social post which made me think this is just him sort of ranting on True Social. And then he said basically the same thing. It was a long rambling post, but he said basically the same thing word for word in the speech, which says this was a planned comment. And as Trump acknowledged at the beginning, he knows, he's trying to say, I don't believe it, but he knows that there is data that the gender gap is working against him. Uh, and I, I do find fascinating, and I, have a, and I have a hard time fully analyzing it, when Trump decides to do something pragmatic Versus when does he decide to just, you know, uh, do whatever the id tells him to do? Uh, I, I find I have a hard time really developing a theory of the case, like when something becomes pragmatic in his mind, when does he choose to kind of pivot? Um, but when it comes to abortion and women, that's definitely one of them. Yeah. And it's not to say when he decides to be pragmatic, he succeeds. I, I, this this line, this logic, this messaging, to my mind, is ludicrous. It's it's the most well, it's, condescending... It's, it's, it's patronizing condescending, paternalistic yeah quasi fascistic <laughs> creepy and, and, and it's you know so it assumes that women don't have agency and that they're little fla fragile flowers that need him to rescue them but mm -hmm. also what does it say about what about god what about husbands or spouses mm -hmm. or you know the, the little platoons of society it's you know we don't he wants to be the savior and protector and he must think that women want that to a certain degree, he must think that like this is this will turn it around. I'll mm -hmm. promise to protect them. That well, well, he, women love that. I mean, I, I do think he probably trusts his gut a lot. Uh, he clearly believes that behaving as a sort of benevolent dictator, a patrolist, like you know, I, I am your savior, I'm your retribution, I can fix this. That he needs to present himself as the sole uh, agent of your security. Uh, that's. That's a theme going back to the beginning of his political career. And so he's applying that. So I will use that to solve my gender gap problem, which strikes me as being idiotic. But that's I think that's where his head is at. Uh, and he's doing that alongside a media strategy, which is very male centric. His convention was very male centric. Hulk Hogan, the Uf UFC uh, fighter, um, Kid Rock. Uh, he's doing all these you know, podcasts like podcasts I don't even know the names of the the Lulk brothers, uh Theo Van. I, I I don't consume any, any of this content, so I know I'm botching people's names. Um I think the all in podcast maybe did one of those. Like I, I I'm reading this all secondhand. But it's all designed not to not just men, but young men. Uh and that's sort of a way to hope to blunt the gender gap. Well if it's gonna be a gender gap, let's sort of supercharge it so I get yeah. <laughs> I get more men. Um I mean obviously you, you can play for men and play for women at the same time, but uh it it all feels like uh, gut based politicking and not data driven I strategy. Agree. Uh, totally. and the male thing is clearly tied to the notion that we're not going to win this with traditional swing voters. We need to pull in people. We need to pull in the unlikely voters and the non registered voters. These guys who are just you know playing Call of Duty on their couches all day long. We got to get them off the couch uh, and vote. Uh, and that's why that's why we'll do these podcasts. So uh, it's all seems like kind of high risk strategy and the kind of thing that I don't think polls are going to necessarily be, you can't be sure that polls are going to capture this. You don't know how they're going to capture how unlikely voters are, go are going to participate. I mean, I'm not saying it can't work. Uh, I'm more skeptical about it because of A, the candidate and B, the people he's hired to reach these people who I don't think are really experts in the GOTV field. But theoretically speaking, if you can get unlikely voters to vote, I mean, yeah. Barack Obama did that in juicing young voters. It's, it's not ludicrous on paper. Just the question of how, we, how is he executing the strategy? Yeah. Well, to your point, Bill, there was a, you might have sent this to me. There was a New York Times story that, um, is the Trump GOTV effort happening? Uh, do they have a ground game? There were, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard there's to- lots of, There are lots of stories about this now. It's not just me. I've, I've seen like six well, or Well, this seven. one was like, nobody can find anyone who's had a door knocked on. Like, and it's that, 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 that was the, That was this week 
and that was an AP story. Okay, okay. But, they, they, but, they, um, these are these are Republican. These are local Republican officials saying, "I don't see the door knockers." Yeah, like maybe uh, it's happening, but no one has seen any like you know door hangers or pamphlets left behind. So it's, well, my understanding is so. One of the reasons why rural voters tend to feel overlooked is that they're they're physically harder to reach. If you're door, if you're, I mean, I've done door knocking. Yeah, you want uh, to do door knocking in townhouses, not yeah. You want to be in densely farm. populated areas because you can hit, yeah. you, it's more efficient. You can hit more people. Uh, if you have to drive ten minutes from house to house, you're not reaching yeah. a lot of people. Uh, and you know, every campaign is a question of how you deploy finite resources. And a lot of campaigns say, you know what, it's just easier to let's just do mail. And, and radio ads and TV ads to the rural folks because physically it's just not a good use of, of our door knockers time. Uh, and there are plenty of, you know, persuadable swing voters in suburban areas that are a little more closely put together. Uh, rural places tend not to have as many swing voters. It tends to be just more, more conservative. The Trump campaign philosophy is there are people in these rural areas that are with us and, and don't vote. And so let's not, let's not waste our time in the suburbs as much. Let's focus on these rural areas. Uh, and so that means if you're a local Republican used to seeing door knocking in suburban areas, you're, you may not be seeing as much of it, if any. Yeah. And it's hard to really spot, you know, GOTV in rural areas because it's, 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 it's a more dispersed population. Uh, that seems to be what's going on here. Uh, and, you know, obviously if he wins, you'll say, well, he saw something that, that a few other people saw. Uh, and I, I would be more nervous about or more respectful of the innovation if I thought he had hired people who had done this before. But we know he's hired Turning Point, Charlie Kirk, who hasn't done this before. Elon Musk is coming late with the America Pack. He's not done this before. And he's been probably cycling through vendors, hiring and firing people over the course of the of the summer and now early fall. Uh, if I was a Republican, I would be super nervous that uh, in a, I mean, GOTV doesn't do all that much for you, uh, uh, generally speaking. But in a close race where it's down to a point, yeah. it could be everything. Yep. And that's get out the vote for anyone who doesn't already know. But if you're listening to this, you probably know what GoTV or GOTV is. Um, another thing along those lines, Bill, a, a question that people are asking is, does it matter if candidates visit swing states? Like, uh, how much does it matter? How much do campaign stops matter? And I know there's been some criticism of Kamala Harris maybe uh, being off the trail a little more than, uh, than maybe she ought to be. But how are you going to, if you're going to prep for a debate, and it seems like she did a really good job prepping for that debate the other week. Maybe you need to be off the trail uh, to get ready. But what, what's your take on that? So I wrote a piece last week because I noticed that Trump's Trump is rallying much less this campaign than 2016 and 2020. And I was specifically looking at the period of time between Labor Day and mid-September. Um, you know, that's the way the general campaign traditionally starts. So it's when they do a bunch of rallies in July, but, you know, usually the fall is when it really starts to matter. Uh, and, you know, he had done basically 11 rallies in 2016, 11 rallies in 2020. And by the, time when I, the point where I written my piece, he'd only done four. Uh, he did a couple other things. He did like, a, I wasn't counting, like you do a town hall with Sean Hannity in Pennsylvania. I wasn't counting that as a rally. I mentioned in the article, but I think it's a little different than a rally. Uh, so it's not like he wasn't doing anything else, but even you took total events, total days in a swing state, 2024 was less than the other than the other two campaigns. Uh, now I said in that article, it's possible that this doesn't necessarily matter that, that campaign stops don't matter. There is, there was research that was done uh, a couple of studies I looked at after 2016 because Trump did more campaign stops than Hillary did. I never made a big deal that she didn't she didn't campaign in person in Wisconsin. Well, that must be why she lost Wisconsin. And these studies show, yeah, you know, there really is no evidence that these stops matter for the most part. I mean, just for, for one example. Donald Trump did a lot of campaigning in Virginia and Colorado in 2016 with it, without really moving the needle in either hmm. of those states. Um, so maybe Hillary should have done Wisconsin, but like, can you prove that it's going to give you a point or two there? Not really. Now, the, the, one of the studies did say it's like it, be, it's over simplistic to say campaign stops never matter. So don't do them; <laughs> they're meaningless. Um, this one researcher found that between Clinton and Trump in 2016. The only time where it did seem to matter was Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania only. Uh, and he was looking at changes in a uh, vote at a, a, on a county level. If she visited this county, hmm. do you and you can and you can you control for the other factors. Can you isolate the campaign visit and determine that that made a difference? And he thought it did in, in, that, in that, that one example. Uh, and he, something about Hillary and the way she connected with Pennsylvania. She didn't win Pennsylvania, mind you. It's just that she, she did better where she visited than, than other places. So on that logic, 
So like with the GOTV logic, you can say, you know what? It probably isn't going to matter, but all else being equal, if I got nothing else to do, I should do as much as I can to try to see maybe it will matter here. Uh, but a campaign has to decide, are there other things to do with the candidate time that can be more impactful? Should I do a bunch of interviews? Should I cut ads? Should I do a policy speech in D.C. or New York? Um, should I do a... a uh, should I do a big rally or should I do a little small thing at a grocery store, meet some people? And so if that becomes a, a news clip, uh, you know, these, uh, do I need to prepare for the, do, do, am I doing a big policy rollout? And therefore I got to spend some time to actually get the policy right, which means I got to hold on with my team. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go to Pennsylvania and get the policy rollout on Wednesday, but I got to spend Monday and Tuesday getting ready for that, you know? So these are the decisions that campaigns have to make. Uh, and so there, there's a question, does the quality of the appearance matter as, as, as much as the, as the quantity? Uh, so I looked at, you know, this week, I wrote a piece at the monthly, because this week Trump's doing more rallies than Kamala is. Trump's got a pretty big packed schedule this week. He seemed to sort of heard the noise that he's being a little, uh, he's been lollygagging. Uh, yeah, once again, Bill Scherer, you know, gets things done. <laughs> your, your criticism has forced Team Trump to up their game this week. Well, they really struck me. It's, it's not like I, I can't know what a candidate does on a day they're off the trail usually, except I know on a recent Sunday he was golfing. Happened the day he almost got, that someone tried to shoot him, but I, I still think it's notable. Like, you, we, Candidates need downtime. They can't be machines. Everyone needs a break. But you're golfing in September with like less than two months to go. That to me is not a good use of candidate time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so maybe he's maybe he's going to cut that out. No, I don't know. Uh, so Kamala is not on the trail as much as Trump this week, but she spent time on a policy speech, which maybe got me a little more of a of a media bump than a standard stunt speech. She's going to the border Friday. That's a way to generate news beyond just the mere act that you're in the state. And you may question whether highly immigration is smart or not smart for her, but she's made a calculation that she's going to lean into this issue and try to and try to narrow that advantage for Trump. So not, not let him own the issue. Uh, so uh, I I don't think it, it makes sense to, because some people were saying that she wasn't working as hard this week as Trump was. I don't think that's the right analysis. We, so we certainly can't know that more stops is better than less stops. Uh, and there is this question whether the quality of the stop has has bearing here. And you know, if Trump does a speech where he says weird things about protecting women, that just makes them upset. Then maybe that's not a good day you spent on the campaign trail. You know, it's yeah. not, not every campaign stops a positive. Some can be negative. Indeed, especially for Kamala, because she's you know doing well. You don't want to mess that up with some gaffe. And I think a gaffe would hurt her more than Trump because it's not fair. Anyway, um, good show, Bill, and happy birthday again, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll be back here next. So next week, it'll be after the, the VP debate. That's right. We'll be here, uh, you know, giving, uh, giving our take and, and uh, stay tuned till then. Go follow us on Twitter at DMZ Show. It's Bill's birthday. Go to patreon.com slash Bill Share and uh, say thanks for the I insight. Much appreciate that. Wisdom he gives us, Bill Share. We'll see you back here in the DMZ next week. Take care.